Thank you all. Uh, you're not going to get a good shot of me, so <laughs> thank you all. So happy new year, new Congress, and we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Recognize uh, Senator Grassley. Okay. Uh, I do this as a point of personal privilege, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that courtesy of you and the members. Uh, this is the first uh, meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee in this 116th Congress. It's also the first time that we convene while my friend Lindsey Graham holds the gavel and will proceed to be chairman. So I'd like to congr congratulate the new chairman, thank him for his leadership, and say that I look forward to working with you and other members of this committee as we seek to address some of our nation's most pressing problems. Uh, I have every confidence that you'll steer our 200-year-old committee in the right direction. Well, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that. In my view, nobody looks over 100, so we're actually <clears throat> we're aging well as a committee. Uh, the bottom line is, how do you get this job? Uh, your colleagues have to vote for you. Thank you. You have to get reelected and outlive the person to your right. So I've been able to, to do that. And I look forward to working with Senator Feinstein, who is, I have a lot of affection and fondness for. She, to me, represents uh, a seriousness that the body needs and a, uh, and a demeanor that I, I think we should all aspire to. To the new colleagues, uh, uh, Senator Hawley, uh, Blackburn, and Ernst, thank you. <laughs> for being part of this committee, to uh, Senator Blackburn and Ernst, thank you for making history, I think, on our side. Uh, as to the hopes and dreams for this committee, to get as much done as possible and to fight when we have to over things that matter to the public and show di two different views of uh, an issue that, that's important, but do it as respectfully as possible. Uh, sentencing reform. Criminal justice reform was a very big deal, and this committee delivered for the country. Senator uh, Durbin, I want to thank you very, very much for working with Senator Lee and Senator Grassley and Senator Booker. That's a big deal that's going to change lives, I think, in a positive way. So this committee has within it the ability to do big things long overdue. I know Senator Blackburn wants to do something on social media. Uh, Senator Klobuchar has got some ideas about how to make sure if you put an ad up on social media, you have to stand by it. We're all worried about the social media platforms being hijacked by terrorists and bad actors throughout the international world. We're worried about privacy. Do you really know what you're signing up for when you get on one of these platforms? I'd like this committee working with Commerce to see if we can find some way to tame the Wild West. Intellectual property, Senator Tillis and Senator Coons have some ideas that I look forward to, to hearing about. Uh, Senator Sass wants to make sure that we act, act ethically. You got a package of ethic, re, ethic reforms, and I look forward to working with you there. On this side, I know there are a lot of ideas that I'm sure that if we sat down and talked, we could embrace. And I look forward to solving as many problems as we can and having a contest over ideas that, that really matter to the American people. Senator Hatch, thank you for coming. Um, in terms of my chairmanship, if I can do what you and Senator Grassley were able to do during your time, I will have uh, done the committee uh, a good service. Senator Grassley, thank you very much. Last year was tough, but I think you and Senator Feinstein did the best you could in the environment in which we live. The times in which we live are very difficult times. I don't see them getting better overnight, but I do see them getting better if we all want them to. So about me, I want us to do better and I'll be as measured as possible. The immigration Lindsay will show up, but the other guy's there too. Yeah. And I don't like him any more than you do. So the bottom line is we're starting off with something that would be good for the country. We have a vacancy for the attorney general spot. We have a chance to fill that vacancy. Mr. Barr is 
you, you can't hold a job. When you look at what he's done in his life, it's incredible. So I want to thank the president for nominating the job. We'll understand on day one what the job is about and can I think we all have concerns. I know Senator uh, Whitehouse is passionate about cybersecurity and Fort Cyber and all these other ideas that Sheldon has been pushing. It's just a matter of time before we hit and hit hard if somebody doesn't step up the plate with some solutions. But a little bit about uh, the nominee. He's been Attorney General before, from 91 to 93, by voice vote. Those were the days. Deputy Attorney General from 90 to 91, unanimous consent without a recorded vote. Assistant Attorney General, Office of Legal Counsel, voice vote. That's pretty amazing. I think you're going to have an actual vote this time. Academically gifted, George Washington Law School, Columbia University undergraduate. Outside of DOJ, who was the General Counsel, Legislative Counsel for the CIA. That's how he met Bush 41. Uh, he's been a law clerk. He's worked in private practice. I'm not going to bore the committee with all the things he's done. He's been the senior vice president, general counsel of GTE. He's li lived a consequential life, general counsel for Ver Verizon. You lived a life that uh, I think has been honorable and noteworthy and accomplished. And I want to thank you for being willing to take this task on. We got a lot of problems at the Department of Justice. I think morale is low and we need to change that. So I look forward uh, to this hearing. You will be challenged. You should be challenged. The memo, there will be a lot of talk about it, as there should be. But I just want to let you know, Mr. Barr, that we appreciate you stepping up at a time when the country needs somebody of your background and your temperament to be in charge of the rule of law. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want you to know I really look forward to working with Me you. Too. And I think we can work productively together. And uh, Senator uh, Grassley, I want to thank you for the time we worked together. It really was a pleasure, and I had an opportunity to get to know you as the fine person that you are. So thank you very much. Um, I want to say just a, one word or two or three about women. 25 years ago, there were no women on this committee. I'll never forget uh, watching the Anita Hill hearing on a television in the London airport with a lot of people gathered around. So I went over to take a look, and I saw, and I saw this all-male Judiciary Committee. And um, it took all these years, but here we are. And I want to particularly welcome Senator Ernst and Senator Blackburn. I think it's extraordinarily important that this committee be representative of our society at large. And we are growing that way. And uh, so thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome Bill Barr and his family. Um, I know you're proud to be here, and you served as Attorney General before, from 91 to 93, and I think we all have great respect for your commitment to public service. Um, when we met, uh, your previous tenure marked a very different, we talked about a very different time for our country. And today we find ourselves in a unique time with a different administration and different challenges. And now, perhaps more than ever before, the country needs someone who will uphold the rule of law, depend the independence, defend the independence of the Justice Department, and truly understand their job is to serve as the people's lawyer, not the president's lawyer. Top of mind for all of us is the ongoing Mueller investigation. Importantly, the Attorney General must be willing to resist political pressure and be committed to protecting this investigation. I'm pleased that in our private meeting, 
as well as in your written statement submitted to the committee, you stated that it's vitally important, and this is a quote, that the special counsel be allowed to complete his investigation, end quote, and that, quote, the public and Congress be informed of the results of the special counsel's work, end quote. However, there are at least two aspects of Mr. Mueller's investigation. First, Russian interference in the United States election and whether any U.S. persons were involved in that interference. And second, possible obstruction of justice. It's the second component that you have written on. And just five months before you were nominated, I spent the weekend on your 19-page a legal memo to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein uh, criticizing Mueller's investigation, specifically the investigation into potential obstruction of justice. In the memo, you conclude, I think, that Press Special Counsel Mueller is, quote, grossly irresponsible for pursuing an obstruction case against the president. Um, and pursuing the obstruction in inquiry is fatally misconceived, so I hope we can straighten that out in this hearing. Okay. Um, but your memo also shows a large sweeping view of presidential authority and a determined effort, I thought, to undermine Bob Mueller, even though you state you have been friends and are in the dark about many of the facts of the investigation. So it does raise questions about your willingness to reach conclusions before knowing the facts and whether you prejudge the Mueller investigation. And I hope you'll make that clear today. It also raises a number of serious questions about your views on executive authority and whether the president is in fact above the law. For example, you wrote the president, and I quote, alone is the executive branch. As such, he is the sole repository of all executive powers conferred by the Constitution. Thus, the full measure of law enforcement authority is placed in the president's hands, and no limit is placed on the kinds of cases subject to his control and supervision. This is in your memo on page 10, and I will ask you about it. This analysis included cases involving potential misconduct, where you concluded, and I quote, the president may exercise his supervisory authority over cases dealing with his own interests, and the president transgresses no legal limitation when he does so. That's on page 12. In fact, you went so far as to conclude that, quote, the framers' plan contemplates that the president's law enforcement powers extend to all matters, including those in which he has a personal stake. You also wrote the Constitution itself places no limit on the president's authority to act on matters which concern him or his own conduct, page 10. Later, you conceded that certain supervisory actions, such as the firing of Director Comey, may be unlawful obstruction. However, this too is qualified. You argue that such a case, in such a case, obstruction of justice occurs only if first a prosecutor proves that the president or his aides colluded with Russia. Specifically, you conclude, and I quote, the issue of obstruction only becomes ripe after the alleged collusion by the president or his campaign is established first, end quote. So that's <clears throat> some of the things I hope to ask you about. And in conclusion, um, let me just say that um, some of your past statements on the role of attorney general and presidential power are concerning. For instance, you've said in the past that the attorney general is the president's lawyer. In November of 2017, you made comments suggesting it would be permissible for the president to direct the Justice Department to open an investigation into his political opponents. 
And this is notable in light of President Trump's repeated calls for the investigation of Hillary Clinton and others who disagree with him. I believe it's important that the next attorney general be able to strongly resist pressure, whether from the administration or Congress, to conduct investigations for political purposes. He must have the integrity, the strength, and the fortitude to tell the president no, regardless of the consequences. In short, he must be willing to defend the independence of the Justice Department. So my questions will be, do you have that strength and commitment to be independent of the White House pressures you will undoubtedly face? Will you protect the integrity of the Justice Department above all else? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Uh, well, Senator Hatch, welcome back. We truly miss you. You were a great chairman and a incredible member of this body, and you're very welcome to share your thoughts about Mr. Barr with this committee. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein as well, and members of the committee. It is my distinct pleasure to be here today to introduce William Barr, the President's nominee to be Attorney General of the United States. I have known and worked with Bill closely over the years, and I'm glad to call him a friend. Bill has had a distinguished career in public service and in the private sector. He started his career at the Central Intelligence Agency. While there, he went to law school part-time at George Washington University. Following graduation, he was selected for a prestigious clerkship with a federal judge on the D.C. Circuit before heading to private practice. Later, he served in the Reagan White House policy development. Following another stint in private practice, Bill began his distinguished career at the Department of Justice under President George H.W. Bush. Bill served as the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, then as Deputy Attorney General, and finally as Attorney General of the United States. As Attorney General, Bill oversaw a number of sensitive criminal investigations, including the investigation into the Pan Am Flight 103 bombing. He prioritized fighting uh, violent crime and became known as the Law and Order Attorney General. Throughout his time at the Justice Department, Bill earned a reputation as a fierce advocate for the rule of law, as a principled and independent decision maker, and as a lawyer's lawyer. He has shown his commitment to the Constitution time and time again while serving our country. That is why he has been confirmed by the Senate unanimously three times. After completing his service at the DOJ, Bill returned to the private sector working at, at law firms and as counsel for some of America's largest companies. I could do, I could go on at length in describing Bill's distinguished career. There is no question, none, whatsoever, that Bill is well qualified to serve as Attorney General. He has held this position before and won high praise during his tenure for his fairness, his tenacity, and his work ethic. So instead of droning on about Bill's resume, I want to tell you about what Bill identifies as the most important achievement of his private service as Attorney General. At least I believe this is what he believes. I believe his answer tells you much about how he will approach the job and who he is. When asked what his most important accomplishment was as Attorney General, Bill does not point to one of his many policy successes. He doesn't talk about his role in setting antitrust uh, uh, <clears throat> merger guidelines. He doesn't say it was his role leading the DOJ's response to the savings and loans crisis. No, for him, it was something more. It was something more tangible. It was Talladega. Three days after Bill was named acting attorney general by President Bush, 121 prisoners noted and seized control of the Talladega Federal Correctional Institution in Alabama. This was a very serious matter. And they took uh, 10 hostages. 
Planning at the DOJ began immediately for how best to resolve the situation and secure the safe release of the hosti hostages. In such a situation, some would have sought political cover, not Bill. He was in charge. He knew the response was his decision to make, his responsibility. He maintained his focus on the safety of the men and women held hostage by the prisoners. The standoff lasted 10 days. Then on Bill's order, FBI agents stormed the prison. Three minutes later, it was over. The hostages were safe. The mission was well planned and executed. Uh, the, federal uh, the federal agents did not even have to fire a single shot. Bill's decision making and judgment helped save lives. When President Bush nominated Bill to be Attorney General in 1991, I noted why he had been selected. He was not a member of President Bush's political or personal inner circle. He was not a part of the President's brain trust. He was not a politician or former politician who, who brought political clout to the position from prior elections or prior election, elected office. Bill Barr was a lawyer's lawyer. Talent, merit, and performance. Those were the reasons President Bush selected him to be the Attorney General at that time. That statement holds true today. Bill Barr, in my opinion, is an outstanding choice for Attorney General. His vast experience, renowned judgment, and reputation as an ardent defender of the rule of law make him a nominee that the American people, the President, and the Senate should all be proud of. So I feel very honored to be here today to speak in his favor, and I hope that his uh, nomination will be approved expeditiously. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Hatch. Uh, I'd like to note at the outset that the rules of the Senate prohibit outbursts, clapping, or demonstrations of any kind. This includes blocking the view of people around you. Please be mindful of these rules as we conduct this hearing. I'll ask the Capitol Police to remove anyone who violates uh, the rules of this committee. Thanks, Senator Hatch. Ms. Barr, would you come forward, please? Thank you. Raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so up you go. I do. <sighs> Floor is yours. Before I begin, Mr. Chairman, could I introduce my family? Absolutely. My wife of 46 years, Christine, a retired librarian. My daughter, Margaret, who we called Meg, she was an assistant United States attorney in the District of Columbia, but now has moved up to Capitol Hill and works for Senator Braun. My middle daughter, Patricia, who's also an attorney, and uh, she has been uh, counsel to the House Agriculture Committee for how long now, Patty? 10? 11 years. <laughs> and. Uh, my daughter, Mary, who uh, is a longtime uh, federal prosecutor uh, and is currently uh, the coordinator for opioid enforcement in the office of the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, Mary's husband, Mike, who uh, is also an attorney at the Department of Justice in the National Security Division, and their son, Mary and Mike's son, uh, Liam, uh, who will someday be in the Department of Justice. <laughs> Patricia's husband, uh, Pelham, who uh, is a founding partner of a consulting firm, and Meg's husband, Tyler, who is also an assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia. Did I leave anyone out? <laughs> Think about medical school, Liam. <laughs> Somebody needs to make money in the family. When, when Meg was go, starting at Notre Dame, I told her to, I wanted a doctor in the family and I made her take organic chem. Needless to say, she's now a lawyer, so. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein and, and members of the committee. 
It's a privilege to come before you today, and I'm honored that President Trump has nominated me for the position of Attorney General. I regret that I come before this committee at a time when uh, much of our government is shut down, and my thoughts are with the dedicated men and women of the Department of Justice and other federal workers, many of whom continue to perform their critical jobs. As you know, if the Senate confirms me this would be my second time I would have the honor of holding this office. During the four years I served under President George H.W. Bush, he nominated me for three successive positions in the department, the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, the Deputy Attorney General, uh, and finally the Attorney General, and this committee unanimously approved me for uh, each of those offices. 27 years ago at my confirmation hearing, I explained that the Office of Attorney General is not like any other cabinet post. It is unique and has a critical role to play under our constitutional system. I said then, the Attorney General has a very special obligation, unique obligations. He holds in trust the fair and impartial administration of justice. It is the Attorney General's responsibility to enforce the law even-handedly and with integrity. The Attorney General must ensure that the administration of justice, the enforcement of the law, is above and away from politics. Nothing could be more destructive of our system of government, of the rule of law, or the Department of Justice as an institution than any toleration of political interference with the enforcement of the law. I believe this as strongly today as I did 27 years ago, indeed more strongly. We live in a time when the country is deeply divided. In the current environment, the American people have to know that there are places in the government where the rule of law, not politics, holds sway, and where they will be treated fairly based solely on the facts and the even-handed application of the law. The Department of Justice must be that place. I did not pursue this position, and when my name was first raised, I was reluctant to be considered and indeed proposed a number of alternative candidates. I'm 68 years old, partially retired and nearing the end of a long legal career. My wife and I were looking forward to a peaceful and cherished time with our daughters and grandchildren. And I've had this job before. But ultimately, I agreed to serve because I believe strongly in public service, I revere the law, I love the Department of Justice and the dedicated professionals who serve there, and I believe that I can do a good job leading the department in these times. If confirmed, I will serve with the same independence I did in 1991. At that time when President Bush chose me, he sought no promises and asked only that his attorney general act with professionalism and integrity. Likewise, President Trump has sought no assurances, promises, or commitments from me of any kind, either express or implied, and I have not given him any, other than that I would run the department with professionalism and integrity. As attorney general, my allegiance will be to the rule of law, the Constitution, and the American people. This is how it should be, this is how it must be, and if you confirm me, this is how it will be. Now let me address a few matters I know are on the minds of some of the members of this committee. First, I believe it is vitally important that the special counsel be allowed to complete his investigation. I have known Bob Mueller for 30 years. We worked closely together throughout my previous tenure at the Department of Justice. We've been friends since, and I have the utmost respect for Bob and his distinguished record of public service. And when he was named special counsel, I said his selection was good news, and that knowing him, I had confidence he would handle the matter properly, and I still have that confidence today. Given his public actions to date, I expect that the special counsel is well along in his investigation. 
At the same time, the president has been steadfast that he was not involved in any collusion with Russian attempts to interfere in the election. I believe it is in the best interest of everyone, the president, Congress, and the American people, that this matter be resolved by allowing the special counsel to complete his work. The country needs a credible resolution to these issues. And if confirmed, I will not permit partisan politics, personal interests, or any other improper consideration to interfere with this or any other investigation. I will follow the special counsel regulations scrupulously and in good faith, and on my watch, Bob will be allowed to finish his work. Second, I also believe it is very important that the public and Congress be informed of the results of the special counsel's work. My goal will be to provide as much transparency as I can consistent with the law. I can assure you that where judgments are to be made, I will make those judgments based solely on the law, and I will not let personal, political, or other improper interests influence my decision. Third, I would like to briefly address the memorandum that I wrote last June. I wrote the memo as a former attorney general who has often weighed in on legal issues of public importance, and I distributed broadly so that other lawyers would have the benefit of my views. My memo was narrow, explaining my thinking on a specific obstruction of justice theory under a single statute that I thought, based on media reports, the special counsel might be considering. The memo did not address, or in any other way, question the special counsel's core investigation into Russian efforts to interfere in the election. Nor did it address other potential obstruction of justice theories or argue that some have wrongly suggested that a president, president can never obstruct justice. I wrote it myself on my own initiative without any assistance and based solely on public information. I would like to comment very briefly on my priorities if confirmed as Attorney General. First, we must continue the progress we've made on violent crime, while at the same time recognizing the changes that have occurred since I last served as Attorney General. The recently passed First Step Act, which I intend to diligently implement if confirmed, recognizes the progress we have made over the past three decades in fighting violent crime. As Attorney General, I will ensure that we will continue our efforts to combat violent crime. In the past, I was focused on predatory violence, but today I am also concerned about another kind of violence. We can only survive and thrive as a nation if we are mutually tolerant of each other's differences, whether they be differences based on race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or political thinking. And yet we see some people violently attacking others simply because of their differences. We must have zero tolerance for such crimes, and I will make this a priority as Attorney General if confirmed. Next, the Department will continue to prioritize enforcing and improving our immigration laws. As a nation, we have the most liberal and expansive immigration laws in the world. Legal immigration has historically been a huge benefit to this country. However, as we open our front door and try to admit people in an orderly way, we cannot allow others to flout our legal system by crashing in through the back doors. In order to ensure that our immigration system works properly, we must secure our nation's borders, and we must ensure that our laws allow us to process, hold, and remove those who unlawfully enter. Finally, in a democracy like ours, the right to vote is paramount. In a period of great political division, one of the foundations of our nation is our enduring commitment to the peaceful transition of power through elections. If confirmed, I will ensure that the full might of our resources are brought to bear against foreign persons who unlawfully interfere in our elections. Fostering confidence in the outcome of elections also means ensuring that the right to vote is fully protected, as well as ensuring the integrity of elections. Let me conclude by making the point 
that over the long run, the course of justice in this country has more to do with the character of the Department of Justice as an enduring institution than with the tenure of any particular attorney general. Above, above all else, if confirmed, I will work diligently to protect the professionalism and integrity of the department as an institution, and I will strive to leave it and the nation a stronger and better place. Thank you very much for your time today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Uh, we'll try to break around 11.30, I think, to get a quick bite and break up the day for you. But uh, one thing I want to tell you is that I support the idea that politicians, no matter of what party, should not interfere with criminal investigations. That makes imminent sense to me. Once you go down that road, then the rule of law collapses. But there's another side to this uh, equation, if I may say a two-way street. What about those in charge of enforcing the law? What about those with the power to bring charges against American citizens, including people up here? I remember uh, Senator Stevens' case in Alaska. So we should always be on guard about the politician interfering in an investigation, but we should also have oversight of how the department works and those with this tremendous power use that power. Are you familiar with the uh, January 11th uh, New York Times article about FBI open inquiry into whether Trump was secretly working on behalf of Russians? Y yes, Mr. Chairman. Would you promise me and this committee to look into this and tell us whether or not, in the appropriate way, a counterintelligence investigation was opened up by somebody at the FBI slash Department of Justice against President Trump? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think there are a number of investigations, as I understand it, going on in the department. Have you ever heard of such a thing in all the time you've been associated with the Department of Justice? Uh, I've, I have never heard of that. Are there rules about how you can do counterintelligence investigations? I believe there are, Mr. Chairman. So if you want to open up one against the president, are there any checks and balances? Uh, n not outside the FBI. Okay. Well, we need to look at that. Uh, in terms of people who are actually enforcing the law, don't we want to make sure they don't have an agenda? That's right, Mr. Chairman. Do you know a uh, Lisa Page or Peter Strzok? I've heard their names. But do you know them personally? No, I don't. This is a message, August 8, 2016, a text message. Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right. Strzok responded, no, no, he's not. We'll stop him. Strzok was in charge of the Clinton email investigation. Ms. Page worked at the Department of Justice. August 15, 2016. I want to believe the path he threw out for consideration in Andy's office, that there's no way he gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before 40. March 4th, 2016. Page destruct. God, Trump is a loathsome human being. October the 20th, 2016. Trump is an effing idiot, is unable to provide a coherent answer. To all those who enforce the law, you can have any opinion of us that you like, but you're supposed to do your job without an agenda. Do you promise me as Attorney General, if you get this job, to look in to see what happened in 2016? Yes, Mr. Chairman. How do these statements sit with you? I was shocked when I saw them. Okay. Please get to the bottom of it. I promise you we will protect the investigation, but we're relying upon you to clean this place up. Uh, FISA warrants. Are you familiar with the FISA warrant? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, during the process of obtaining a warrant, is there a certification made by the Department of Justice to the court that the information being provided is reliable? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with uh, Bruce Orr? No, I'm not. Bruce Orr was Associate Deputy Attorney General for Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement. His wife worked at Fusion GPS. Are you familiar with Fusion I've, I've, GPS? Yes, I've read about that. Fusion GPS, uh, Mr. Barr, was hired 
by the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign to do opposition research against candidate Trump and maybe other candidates. But we now know that they hired Fusion GPS, Michael Steele, who is a former British agent, uh, to do opposition research and produce the famous dossier. Were you aware that Mr. Orr's wife worked for that organization? I've read that. Does that bother you if he had anything to do with the case? Yes. Are you aware that on numerous occasions he met with Mr. Steele while his wife worked with Fusion GPS? I've read that. Okay. The warrant certification against Carter Page on four different occasions certifies that the dossier, which was the main source of the warrant, was reliable. Would you look in to see whether or not that was an accurate statement and hold people accountable if it was not? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mueller, you say you've known Mueller a long time. Would you say you have a close relationship with Mr. Mueller? I would say we were good friends. Would you say uh, that you understand him to be a fair-minded person? Absolutely. Do you trust him to be fair to the president and the country as a whole? Yes. When his report comes to you, will you share it with us as much as possible? Consistent with the regulations and the law, yes. Do you believe Mr. Mueller would be involved in a witch hunt against anybody? I don't, I don't believe Mr. Mueller would, would uh, be involved in a witch hunt. What are the circumstances that would uh, allow a special counsel to be appointed? generally speaking? Well, I appointed uh, three, Mr. Chairman, a special counsel. And, and, and generally, when, when something comes up, an issue comes up that needs to be investigated, and there are good reasons to have it investigated by a special counsel outside the normal chain at the department, someone usually of public stature that can provide additional assurance of nonpartisan— Do you believe that Attorney General Sessions had a conflict because he worked on the Trump campaign? Uh, I'm not sure of all the facts, but I, I think he probably did the right thing recusing himself. Uh, I agree. I think he did the right thing to recuse himself. Do you know Rod Rosenstein? Yes, I do. What's your opinion of him? I have a very high opinion of Rod Rosenstein and his service in the department. Okay. Why did you write the memo? Uh, I wrote the memo because uh, Starting, I think, in June of 2017, there were many news reports, and, and, and I had no facts, and none of us really outside the department have facts, but I read a lot of news reports suggesting that there were a number of potential obstruction theories that were being uh, contemplated, uh, or at least explored. One theory in particular uh, that appeared to be under consideration under a specific st statute concerned me because I thought it would involve stretching the statute beyond what was intended and would do it in a way uh, that would have serious adverse consequences for all agencies that are involved in, in the administration of justice, especially the Department of Justice. And I thought it would have a chilling effect going forward over time. And my memo is very clear, that is the concern that was driving me. The, the impact, not the particular case, but its impact of a rule over time. And I wanted to make sure that before anyone went down this path, if that was in fact being considered, that the full implications of the theory were carefully thought out. So I wanted my views to get in front of the people who would be involved in, and the various lawyers who would be involved in those discussions. So I first raised these concerns verbally with Rod Rosenstein uh, when I had lunch with him early in 2008. And uh, he did not respond and, and, and was sphinx-like in his reaction, but I expounded on my concerns. And then uh, I later attempted to uh, provide a written analysis as follow-up. Now, I initially thought of an op-ed, and, and because of the material, it wasn't working out. And I, I talked to uh, his staff, and I said, you know, I want to follow up and send some, something to Rod in writing, but is he a one-pager kind of guy, or, or, you know, how much will he read? And the guy said, he, he's like you. He doesn't mind wading into a dense Don't you illegal think memo. President Trump is a one-pager kind of guy? Excuse me? President Trump is a one-pager kind of guy. He, I, I suspect he is. Okay, just remember that. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and so I, I provided the memo to Rod and I provided it, uh, distributed it freely among the other lawyers that I thought would be interested in it. And I think it was entirely proper. It's very common for me and for other former senior officials to weigh in on matters that they think may be ill-advised and may have ramifications down the road. For example, just a few months before that, I had weighed in repeatedly to complain about the idea of prosecuting Senator Menendez. Uh, I think I made three calls. I think it was two to, uh, to Sessions, uh, to AG Sessions, and one to Rosenstein. Now, I didn't know Senator Menendez. I don't represent Senator Mendez. No one was paying me to do it. And in fact, I don't port, support Senator Menendez politically. <coughs> but I carefully watched this case. My friend Abby Lowell was, was his defense counsel, and it was very much like a line of cases that I had been concerned about when I was uh, AG, and so I was watching it, and I thought the prosecution was based on a fallacious theory that would have bad long-term consequences, and so I freely weighed in at the department. Uh, and I did so because I care about the rule of law. And I want to say one final thing on the rule of law because it picks up on something you said, Mr. Chairman. What is the rule of law? We all use that term. In the area of enforcement, I think the rule of law is that when you apply a rule to A, it has to be the same rule and approach you apply to B, C, D, and E, and so forth. And that seems to me to suggest two corollaries for an attorney general. The first, that's why we don't like political interference. Political interference means that the rule being applied to A isn't the rule you're applying to A. It's special treatment because someone's in there exerting political influence. The corollary to that, and this is what you're driving at, Mr. Chairman, is that when you apply a rule, when, when a prosecutor is applying a rule to A, you've got to be careful that it's not torqued, especially for that case, in a way that couldn't be applied down the road, or if it is applied, will create problems down the road. And I think the Attorney General's job is both. It is both to protect against interference, but it's also to provide oversight to make sure that in each individual case, the same rule that would be applied broadly is being applied to the individual. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, six quick yes or no questions. Will you commit to no interference with the scope of the special counsel's investigation? I, I will. Uh, the, uh, the scope of the uh, special counsel's investigation by is, is set by his, his charter and, and by the regulations, and I will ensure that those are maintained. Will you commit to providing Mr. Mueller with the resources, funds, and time needed to complete his investigation? Yes. Will you commit to ensuring that Special Counsel Mueller is not terminated without good cause, consistent with Department regulations? Absolutely. If Special Counsel Mueller makes any request, for instance, about the scope of his investigation or resources for his investigation, will you commit to notifying Congress if you deny that request? I, th I think the regulations require uh, notification of Congress if there's a disagreement. Thank you. And I have two questions from the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Will you commit to making any report Mueller produces at the conclusion of his investigation available to Congress and to the public? As, as I said in my statement, I am going to make as much information available as I can, consistent with the rules and regulations that are part of the special counsel regulations. Will you commit to making any report on the obstruction of justice public? I, that's the same answer. Thank yes. you. Um, in your June 2018 memo about obstruction of justice to the Mueller investigation, you repeatedly referred to Mueller's, quote, sweeping and all-encompassing interpretation of Section 1512, which is the sta a statute on obstruction. How do you know what Mueller's interpretation of 1512 is? Well. As I said, I was, I was speculating. I freely said at the, uh, the beginning, I was writing in the dark, and we're all in the dark. Every lawyer, every talking head, everyone who uh, thinks about or talks about it doesn't have the facts. So I spent my Saturday reading that memorandum. Yeah. 
So are you saying this is all your speculation? It's a big memo. Well, it, it was informed to the extent that I, I thought that that was one of the theories being considered. And I don't know how seriously, whether it was being considered or how seriously it was be, being considered. But uh, I, I, as a shorthand way in the memo of referring to what I was speculating might be the theory, I referred to it as Mueller's theory, rather than go in every time I mention it, say, well, this so is speculative. Do you know what Mueller's interpretation of 1512 is? No, I don't know what Mueller's interpretation. Okay. But uh, and just one point, uh, Senator. I think, I, I, you said in your opening statement, I said he was grossly irresponsible. I think I said if something happens, it would be grossly irresponsible. I was not calling Mueller grossly irresponsible. I understand. Thank okay. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Has anyone given you non-public information about Mueller's investigation? I don't, I don't recall getting any uh, confidential information about the investigation. Your 2018 mem in it, you stated, and I quote, the framers' plan contemplates that the president's law enforcement powers extend to all matters, including those in which he had a personal stake, end quote. Please explain what you base this conclusion on. Y yes. Here's the Department of Justice right here. And within the Department of Justice, enforcement decisions are being made. The president's over here. And I think of it as there are two categories of potential communications. One would be on a case that the president wants to communicate about that he has no personal interest in, no political interest in. Let's say the president's concerned about Chinese stealing trade secrets and say, I want you to go after this company that's being, you know, that may be stealing trade secrets. That's perfectly appropriate for him to do. To, to communicate that. But whether it's bona fide or not, the Department of Justice's obligation and the Attorney General's obligation is not to take any action unless we reach, we, the Department of Justice and the Attorney General, reach their own independent conclusion that it is justified under the law. And regardless of the instruction. And that's my quote that everyone is saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sicking the, you know, it's okay for the, uh, for the uh, president to direct things. All I said was, it's not per se improper for the president to call on the department for doing something, especially if he has no personal uh, or, or political interest in it. The other category of cases, and let's pick a, you know, an easy bad example, would be if a member of the, uh, the president's family or a business associate or something was under investigation and he tries to intervene. He, he's the chief law enforcement officer, and you could say, well, he has the power, but that would be a breach of his obligation under the Constitution to faithfully execute the laws. So, in my opinion, if he attempts, if a president attempts to intervene in a matter that he has a stake in to, to, to protect himself, that should first be looked at as a breach of his constitutional duties, whether it also violates a statute, depending on what statute comes into play and what all the facts are. Including the emollients clause of the uh, Constitution. I, well, I think there's a dispute as to what the emoluments clause relates to. I, I have not personally researched the emoluments clause. I, I, I can't even tell you what it says at this point. My, off the top of my head, I would have said, well, emoluments are essentially a stipend attached to some office, but I don't know if that's correct or not. But I'm sure, okay, it's, well, I think it's being litigated right now. I'm going to, uh, I don't know either, so I'm going to try and find out, and we'll come back another okay. day and maybe discuss okay. it. Your memo stated a fatal flaw in Mueller's interpretation of 1512C2 is that while defining obstruction solely as acting corruptly, Mueller offers no definition of what corruptly means. My understanding is that there's nothing in the public record that sheds light on his definition of obstruction. Do you know what his definition is? Um, 
I, I don't know what his definition is. I, I read a book where people were asking whether someone was, I, I, I think, I, I don't know if it was accurate, but uh, whether uh, someone, the president was acting with corrupt intent. And, and what I say in my memo is actually, the, people don't understand what the word corruptly means in that statute. It's an adverb, and it's not meant to mean with the state of mind. It's actually meant the way in which the influence or obstruction is committed. That's its adverbial function in the statute. And what it means is using it in the 19th century sense, it meant to influence it in a way that changes something that's good and fit to something that's bad and unfit, namely the corruption of evidence or the corruption of a decision maker. That's what the word corruptly means, because once you dissociate it from that, it really means very hard to discern what it means. It means bad. What does bad mean? Let me go on, because my time is so limited. You argue that the—and I quote—the Constitution's plenary grant of those powers to the president also extends to the unitary character of the executive branch itself. Specifically, you argue, and this is a quote, while Mueller's immediate target is the president's exercise of his discretionary powers, his obstruction theory reaches all exercises of prosecutorial discretion by the president's subordinates, from the attorney general down to the most junior line prosecutor, end quote. So, if the president orders the attorney general to halt a criminal investigation for personal reasons, would that be prohibited under your theory? Prohibited by what? By uh, the Constitution. The Constitution. I think it would be. I think it would be a, a breach of the president's duties to faithfully execute the law. It'd be an abuse of power. Whether it would violate a statute depends on all the facts and what statute I would someone would cite me to. But I certainly think it would be an abuse of his power. And and, and let me just say would, that the position. Would that be the same thing if an attorney general fired U.S. attorneys for political reasons? No, uh, because U.S. attorneys are political appointments. According to news reports, President Trump interviewed you and asked you to be part of the legal team defending him in the Mueller investigation twice. First in the spring of 17, when the investigation was just beginning, <clears throat> and again earlier this year. Is that correct? No, uh, no. He, 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 I had one conversation with him that related to uh, his private representation. I, I can describe that for you. That was, that was in June of 2017. That's the only time I met him before uh, I talked to him about the job of attorney general, which obviously is not the same as representing him. Have you discussed the Mueller investigation with the president or anyone else in the White House? Um, I discussed the uh, Mueller investigation, but not not in not in in any particular substance. I can go through my conversations uh, with you if if you want. Well, not not at this time, but I may come back to you okay. and ask you about that. I don't want to take any more time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No. Senator Grass. Before I ask my first question, and I don't want you to respond to this, I just want you to know what my interest is in the <clears throat> transparency of the Mueller report. When we spend 35, I don't know whether it's 25 million or 35 million dollars, the taxpayers, uh, that's billions of dollars, uh, the taxpayers ought to know what their money was spent for. So if you've got some reservations about some part of it uh, not being public, I hope that that's related to traditional things that, of the public's business that shouldn't be public, like national security as an example, not being made public. But beyond that, the only way I know for the taxpayers to hold anybody that spends the taxpayers' money uh, responsibly is uh, through transparency, because that brings accountability. My first question, <clears throat> and as you would expect from our conversation in my office, 86, Reagan signed the False Claims Act. I worked hard to get that passed, especially pro uh, provisions empowering whistleblowers to help 
government identify fraud. More than a decade ago, you said the key TAM provisions in the False Claims Act were your words, an abomination, and were unconstitutional. You said you, in your words, wanted to attack the law, but the Supreme Court upheld the law's constitutionality. Prosecutors from both sides of the aisle have praised the law as the most effective tool government has to detect uh, and actually recover public money lost to fraud. Since 1986, the law that was passed in 1986 brought in $56 billion into the federal treasury. Most of that's because patriotic whistleblowers found the fraud and brought the case uh, to the attention of the government. Is the False Claims Act unconstitutional? No, Senator. It's uh, been upheld you, by the Supreme Court. Do you consider the False Claims Act to be an abomination? Uh, no, I don't. Does the False Claims Act benefit the taxpayer, specifically its provisions to empower and protect whistleblowers? Yes, Senator. Uh, if confirmed, do you commit to not take any action to undermine the False Claims Act? Further, if confirmed, will you continue current Justice Department staff and funding levels to properly support and prosecute uh, False Claims Act cases? Yes, I will diligently uh, enforce uh, the False Claims Act. Now, with all those positive answers, you'd think I'd be done, wouldn't you, with that? But let me go on. <laughs> yeah. Just to show you that there is some forces out there that I'm suspicious about within the Department of Justice, we have a new Department of Justice guidance document out last year known as the Granston Memo, provides a long list of reasons that the Department can use to dismiss False Claims Act cases, some of them pretty darn vague, such as preserving the, these are their words, preserving government resources. Just think of all the mischief those three words can bring. Of course, the government can dismiss, obviously, meritless cases. I don't argue with that. But even when the department declines to participate in False Claims Act cases, the taxpayer can, in many cases, still recover financially. So it's important to allow whistleblowers to pursue cases even when the department isn't able to be involved. Uh, under what circumstances can or should the Justice Department move to dismiss false claims cases? S Senator, I haven't reviewed that memorandum, so I'm not familiar with the thinking of the people in this. I think it's the civil division that did that, but if I'm confirmed, I will review it, and I'm, I would be glad to come and sit down with you and discuss it, and if there are areas you're concerned about, I'd be glad to work with you on that. Unless you find that my presumption is wrong, that there's reasons to be <laughs> suspicious, I hope you'll take into consideration my feeling about how, in various suspicious ways, people that are faceless bureaucrats can undermine this effort. In circumstances where the government doesn't intervene in false claims cases, if confirmed, will you commit to ensuring the department doesn't unnecessarily dismiss false act cases? Yes, Senator, I will, I will enforce the law in good faith. Okay. Now, got an act that the Justice Department just took, and I can't obviously expect you to respond specifically to their act, but I use it as an example of their uncooperation with the Department of Congressional Oversight. Uh, this uncooperative uh, behavior needs to change. On December the 10th last year, the department confirmed a briefing for uh, your staff regarding asset forfeiture fund and to do that last week, January the 8th. On January the 7th, Department of Justice Office of Legal or Legislative Affairs informed our staff that they will no longer provide the briefing because they consider the matter closed as a result of the change in chairmanship and because you released a public memo, because I released a public memo on the Marshall Service study or investigation. It's important to gain your commitment 
on how you would handle this as an example. Uh, let me explain how ridiculous it is to get somebody in this administration saying that they don't have to answer if you aren't chairman of a committee. We went through this in January, the first month this president was in office, when he said, or he put out a memo, we aren't going to answer any oversight except for chairman of the committees. So you're going to write off 500 members of Congress not doing oversight. So we told them all about this and the constitutional cases on this. We got them up. They wrote a memo again two months later that said that they were going to respond to all this stuff. Now, you got people in the bowels of the bureaucracy that are they're still saying, if you aren't a chairman, you, you ain't going to get an answer to anything. How ridiculous. It's our constitutional responsibility. So then I laid out, uh, I'll give you an example. I sent the Justice Department a classified letter regarding information acquired from the Justice Department Inspector General report on the Clinton investigation. The department ought to answer for what the attorney uh, Inspector General has found, but I haven't heard a peep, not a peep, uh, on that yet. On December the 10th, the Justice Department, well, I'm repeating here. So the question is, do you understand that if you're confirmed, you have an obligation to ensure the Justice Department, and particularly the FBI is a problem, respond to congressional inquiries and to do it in a timely manner? Absolutely, Senator. Do you understand that this obligation applies regardless of whether you're a member of Congress or a committee chairman? Yes, Senator. I, you know, you and, and Senator Leahy, I think, are the only members of the committee now who were here 27 years ago when I was first confirmed. But I think you will recall that uh, we were able to we were able to establish very cooperative and productive relationships with all the members and try to respond to their questions and deal with their concerns and work with them on projects they're interested in and. Um, that will be the same approach that I will tr br bring to the job if you confirm me. Okay. Then let me be specific uh, on my last question on oversight. Uh, you remember when you were in my office, I gave you as I gave Attorney General Sessions, as I gave a Holder, a long list of things that the department has not answered. And one of these was an October 17, 2018 letter. Um, and, and I'd like to have your uh, response to answering that letter and respond to all outstanding and future oversight requests in a timely manner. And then, remember, I said all you cabinet people come up here to tell us yes when we ask you if you're going to answer our stuff. I said maybe you better say maybe. So if you want to say maybe now and be really honest, say maybe. <laughs> Otherwise, I hope you'll answer that October 17th letter once we get you voted into office. Yes, Senator. Uh, throughout your career, you've expressed concern with congressional attempts to enact criminal justice reform and at times advocated for stricter mandatory minimum sentences. In 92, under your direction, DOJ published a report entitled the case for more incarceration. This report declared that the problem with our criminal justice system was that we were incarcerating too few criminals. More recently, in 2015, you signed a letter opposing the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act of 2015. This letter states quite clearly your opposition to sentencing reform, particularly the lessening of mandatory minimum sentences, any sort of retroactivity. The First Step Act was signed by President Trump. As Attorney General, it'll be your job to implement the legislation, even though you've opposed criminal justice reform in the past, will you commit to fully implementing the First Step Act? Yes, Senator. But, I, 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 you know, in 1992, when I was Attorney General, the violent crime rates were the highest in American history. The sentences were extremely short. Typically, in, in many states, the time served for, for rape was three years. For murder, time served five to seven years. It was, uh, the system had broken down. Uh, and I think through a series of uh, administrations, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, the laws were changed. And we targeted violent, cr chronic violent offenders, especially those using guns. And I think the reason the crime rate is much lower today is because of those policies. So I don't think comparing the policies that were in effect in 1992 to the situation now is, is really fair. And I think, and I've said, 
that uh, right now we have greater regularity in sentencing. There's broader recognition that chronic violent offenders uh, should be incarcerated for significant periods of time to get them off the streets. Uh, and I think uh, the time was right to take stock and um, uh, make changes to our penal system based on current experience. So I have no problem uh, with the approach of uh, reforming the sentencing structure. Um, and I will uh, faithfully enforce that law. Don't take it personal if I raise my voice to you. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> if I were you, I'd answer his letters just as for the, <laughs> a tip that may help you through your job if you get it. Uh, I'll take the time away from my second round. I'm very curious about the conversations you had uh, about personal representation being yep. attorney general. You mentioned it, Senator Feinstein. Can you kind of give yep. us a summary of what you were talking about? Yeah, so in June of 2017, middle of June, uh, Ambassador uh, David Friedman, who's the U.S. ambassador to Israel, who I didn't know, I knew that he was a top-tier lawyer in New York and <laughs> apparently a friend of the president's, he reached out to me and we talked uh, one evening and he said that uh, he, well, my understanding was he was he was interested in in finding lawyers that could augment the defense team, uh, and failing that, he wanted to identify Washington lawyers who had experience, you know, broad experience that uh, whose perspective might be useful to the presidents, um, and. He asked me a number of questions like, you know, what have you said about the president publicly? Do you have any conflicts and so forth? And uh, uh, I told him that I, I didn't think I could take this on, uh, that I had just taken on a big uh, corporate client that was very important to me and expected a lot of work. And I said at my point in life, I, I uh, really didn't want to take on this burden and that I actually preferred the freedom to uh, not have any representation of an individual, but just say what I thought uh, about anything without having to worry about that. And um, and I said that, I, that I, my wife and I were sort of looking forward to a bit of respite, and I didn't want to stick my head into that meat grinder. He asked me if I would nonetheless meet, you know, just briefly go over the next day to meet with the president. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll go and meet with the president. And he brought me over and was squeezing me in. I, it looked to me like it was before the morning staff meeting because people were grouping by the door to get in. And, and I went in and he was there. The ambassador was there, sat through the meeting. It was a very brief meeting where uh, essentially uh, the president wanted to know, you know he, he said, oh, you know Bob Mueller. How well do you know Bob Mueller? And I told him how well I knew Bob Mueller and, our, and, and how, you know, the Bars and Mullers were good friends and, and would be good friends when this is all over and so forth. And he was interested in that, wanted to know, you know, what I thought about, you know, Mueller's integrity and so forth and so on. And I said, Bob is a, is a straight shooter and should be dealt with as such. And uh, sort of, he said something to the effect like, so uh, are you envisioning some role here? And I said, you know, actually, Mr. President, right now is, is, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, you know, I just, my personal and my professional obligations are such that I'm, I'm unable to do it. So he asked me for my phone number. I gave it to him and I never heard from him again uh, until. Well, I tried that once. <laughs> <laughs> You did better. Well, I, I didn't hear I hear from him until you know later, but uh, about something different, which okay. was the attorney general position. Well, thank you, Mr. Barr. Good to see you again. We've, as you mentioned, uh, Senator Grassley and I were here at your hearing a number of years ago. Let me go back even before that. Uh, Forty-six years ago, I was not in the Senate. I was state's attorney and. Vermont, and uh, I watched with a great deal of interest the Elliot Richardson hearings. He'd been nominated to be Attorney General at the midst of Watergate. He made several commitments to the uh, committee, including appointing a special prosecutor, and he promised to protect his independence. And I 
as, as one who had total independence as an elected prosecutor uh, in Vermont, I thought how important it was to have the same independence at the national level. And Mr. Richardson said it was necessary to create the maximum possible degree of public confidence in the integrity of the process. I've never forgotten that. But I think the integrity of our institutions is just as much at risk today. President Trump has made it clear he views the Justice Department as an extension of his political power. He's called on it to target his opponents. He obsesses over the Russia investigation, which looms over his presidency, may define it. He attacks the special counsel almost daily. He fired both the previous FBI director and attorney general for not handling the investigation as he pleased. <laughs> that tells me the rule of law can no longer be taken for granted. So if confirmed, the president's going to expect you to do his bidding. I can almost guarantee you he'll cross the line at some point. That's why the commitment you make here today, just like those I watched Elliot Richardson make years ago, matter greatly. So will you commit, if confirmed, to both seeking and following the advice of the department's career ethics officials on whether you must recuse from the special counsel's investigation? Uh, I, I will seek uh, the advice of the career uh, ethics uh, personnel, but under the regulations, I make the decision as the head of the agency as to my own recusal. So I, I certainly would consult with them, and, and at the end of the day, I would make a decision uh, in good faith based on uh, the laws and the facts that are uh, evident at that time. Same thing if you're um, talking about a conflict of interest? Well, no, some conflicts, as you know, are, are mandatory. I'm thinking what uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions and when asked a similar question, he said he'll seek and follow the advice. Seek and follow the advice of the Department of Justice's uh, designated ethics officials. So let me ask you, maybe in a different way. I know you promised to not interfere with the special counsel. Are there any circumstances that would cause you to terminate the investigation or any component of it? or significantly restricted funding? Under the, under the regulations, Bob Mueller could only be terminated for good cause, and I, frankly, it's unimaginable to me that Bob would ever do anything that uh, gave rise to good cause. But in theory, if, if something happened that was good cause, for me, it would actually take more than that. It'd have to be pretty grave, and the public interest would essentially have to compel it, because I believe right now the overarching public interest is to allow him to finish. I, I would agree with that, but I also think over the past 18 months, you rather harshly prejudge the investigation in some of your writings. Well, I, I, I you know, I... I I don't see that at all, Senator. You know, okay. when you strip away a lot of the rhetoric, the two things that have been thrown up as me sort of being antagonistic to the investigation are two things. One, a very mild comment I made that, gee, I wish the team had been more balanced. I wasn't criticizing Mueller. I believe that prosecutors, and I think you would agree, uh, they can handle the case professionally, whatever their politics are. They, they, you know, a good prosecutor can leave their politics uh, at the door and go in and do the job. And I think that's what Justice Department prosecutors do in general. But you also are very critical, but of the Russian probe. And uh, I mean, I can't think of anything that would, in your memo, for example, that would jump out more for this president because of his commitment to it. And I ask that because some have said uh, on both sides of the aisle that it looked like a job applica application. And so that's what I want you to refer to. Well, I, I, you know, to, 
that's ludicrous. If I wanted the job and was going after the job, there are many more direct ways of me bringing myself to the president's attention than writing an 18-page legal memorandum, or, or sending it to the Department of Justice and routing it to other— to, But also uh, publicly criticize the Russian probe. I mean, well, that, How have I criticized the Russian po the po probe? You don't have any criticism of the Russian probe? Not at all. I think I, I believe the Russians uh, interfered uh, or attempted to interfere uh, with the election, and I think we have to get to the bottom of it. So you, you would uh, be in favor of releasing the investigative report when it's completed? As I've said, I, I'm in favor of as much transparency as there can be consistent with the rules and the law. Do you uh, see a case where the president could uh, claim executive privilege uh, and say that parts of the uh, report could not be released? Well. I don't have a clue as to what would be in the report. The report could end up being, you know, not very big. I don't know what's going to be in the report. In theory, if if uh, there was executive privilege uh, material that to which an executive privilege claim could be made, it might, con you know, it, 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 someone might raise a claim of executive. That'd privilege. be pretty difficult following the U.S. versus Nixon when. Uh, the Supreme Court unanimously rejected President Nixon's claims of executive privilege over the Watergate tapes. But I, I, I ask it because the president's attorney, Mr. Giuliani, said the president should be able to correct the Mueller report before any public release. So in other words, he could take this investigative report, put his own spin on it and correct it before its release. Do you commit that would not happen if you were Attorney General? That will not happen. Thank you. Um, you had, um, when you're AG, I remember this well because I was here in the Senate at the time, you encouraged President George H.W. Bush uh, to pardon all six individuals who were targeted in Iran-Contra. Independent prosecutor investigating the matter labeled that a, a cover up. Um, now, you and I talked about this in my office, and I appreciate you coming by. I, uh, I found the conversation the two of us had be well worthwhile. Do you uh, believe a president could lawfully issue a pardon? in exchange for the recipient's promise to not incriminate him? No, that would be a crime. Thank you. Um, in 1990, you argue that Congress appropriation power is not an independent source of congressional power to control the allocation of government resources. Only three committees in the Senate have a vice chairman. Appropriation is one of them. Obviously, as vice chairman, I kind of looked at that. Uh, you claim that if a president finds no appropriated funds within a given category, he may use funds from another category, as long as both categories are in his constitutional purview. Now, this says vice chairman appropriations committee. Don't be surprised, I disagree. Congress is power of the purse, Article 1, Section 9. I believe constitutes one of the most fundamental and foundational checks and balances on the executive branch. So do you believe the president can ignore Congress appropriations, allocations, conditions, and restrictions in law? Just ignore them and take the money and transfer Not, not as a general proposition, but I just, that, that was a— a general problem. I actually thought that was a good law review article. I gave it as a speech, and it was really a thought piece. And what I was really saying was, and, and I say right up front, that the more I thought about the appropriations power, the more confused I got. And, and I was just laying out uh, a, a potential template, which is this. People frequently say, you know, the power to— you know, spend money on this division or this missile system is part of the power of the purse. And what I was actually saying was, you know, actually what right, what the power being exercised there is the substantive power that Congress has to raise armies. 
and 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 it's not it doesn't yeah, come we also from have the power specific of appropriations on agriculture and fence. I mean, for example, could a, a president just build a wall along our southern border uh, because he wanted to and just take the money, whether appropriate or not? What about eminent domain? What about eminent domain? Well, if you're going to build a wall, you got to take a whole lot of land away from landowners oh. in Texas and elsewhere. Well, you know, you'd have to show me what statute uh, is being invoked and also what appropriations is being used. I, I can't answer that in the abstract. So you're saying the president, though, can have the power to go into money even if the Congress is appropriated for a different purpose? No, I, I didn't say that. I, it, but some you mean I, that? I don't, no, I don't mean that. I'm saying that, it, you know, there are monies that the president may have power to shift because of statutory authority. <clears throat> but that would have been because Congress gave him that authority. Right. Not because he has it automatically. I, I'm not taking that position. As I said, my, my law review, it was published as a law review article, and it was a, a thought piece exploring what limits there might be to the appropriations power and what where, where Congress's power comes from in certain areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up on that real quick, and I won't take this against their corner, did the Article II powers, the inherent authority of the Commander-in-Chief, give him the ability to take appropriated dollars for the Department of Defense and build a wall? I can't I, I, Without looking at the, the statute, I really couldn't answer that. I'm not talking about a statute. I'm talking about the inherent authority of the President. Commander in Chief. That's the kind of question I would go to OLC to answer. Okay. Get back with us on that, Senator Corn. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, congratulate you on your um, election as chairman of the Judiciary Committee and tell you we look forward to working with you and supporting this committee's efforts. Thank you for convening today's hearing. And I want to express my profound and sincere thanks to uh, the nominee, Mr. Barr, for. Um, agreeing to serve a second time as Attorney General. I noted in your statement, you said it was 27 years ago that you sat in this chair and went through your first confirmation hearing. And to me, that says a lot about your character and your commitment to the rule of law that you would be willing to go through this process again and serve once again as the chief law enforcement officer of the, uh, of the country. Thank you for doing that. Thank, Thank you, Senator. Your, Thank you to your, fam your family as well. To me, the Attorney General is, is one of the most challenging cabinet offices to hold because, as you point out in your opening statement, you are committed to the rule of law and, and enforcing the laws of the land, but you are also a political appointee of a president. If you are serving another cabinet position, um, certainly you're committed to implementing the president's agenda or the agenda of an administration, but there, as attorney general, that is not an unequivocal commitment because there may be some things that the administration wants you to do that you cannot do consistent with the rule of law, correct? That's right, Senator. One of the reasons I ultimately decided that I, I, I would uh, accept this position if it was offered to me was because I was, I, I feel that I'm in a position to be independent. You know, over the years, a lot of people have, uh, some, some politicians have called me up saying, you know, I'm thinking of going for the attorney general position in this administration and so forth. And I say, you're crazy. Because if you view yourself as having a political future down the road, don't take the job. Because if you take this job, you have to be ready you know, for to, to, to make decisions and spend all your political capital and have no future because you have to do, you have to have that freedom of action. And, um, and uh, I feel I'm in a position in life where, where I can do the right thing and not really care about the consequences in the sense that uh, I don't, I, I I, I can truly be independent. Mr. Barr, thinking back about the run-up to the 2016 election, 
where the nominee of both political parties for president of the United States ended up being investigated by the FBI. Can you think of any precedent in American history where that's occurred that you know of? No, I can't, Senator. And thinking back to um, James Comey's press conference of July the 7th, 2016, where he took the step of talking about the evidence against Mrs. Clinton, talking about the legal standard that would apply as to whether she might or might not be indicted uh, for committing a crime under the Espionage Act. Have you ever seen a situation where an FBI director would usurp the authority of the Department of Justice to make that charging decision and hold a press conference and talk about all of the derogatory information that the investigation had gleaned against a potential defendant and then say, now we're, we're not going to, no reasonable prosecutor would indict her? Have you ever seen anything like that happen before? No, I've never seen that, and I, th I thought it was a little bit, more than a little bit, it was weird at the time, but my initial reaction to it was, I think Attorney General Lynch had said something, you know, she was under pressure to recuse herself, I think, because of the so-called tarmac meeting, right. and I think she said something like she was going to defer to the FBI. Mm -hmm. So my initial reaction to that whole thing was, well, she must have agreed, or it must have been the plan, that he was going to make the decision and go out and announce his decision. Um, under, under, but, the, under the normal rules, if the, um, if the attorney general is, has a conflict of interest— It would go to the deputy. It would go to the deputy, Correct. not to the FBI director to make that decision. Correct. Right. So I, that's why I thought it was very strange, but uh, I think later it became— clearer, to the extent there's anything clear about it, that uh, I, don't, I don't think Attorney General Lynch had, a, had uh, essentially delegated that authority to the director. And I think Jim Comey, is a, as I've said, is an extremely gifted man who's uh, served the country with distinction in, in many roles. Uh, but I thought that to the extent he, he actually announced a decision, um, was wrong. And the other thing is, if you're not going to indict someone, then you don't stand up there and unload negative information about the person. That's not the way the Department of Justice does business. I was shocked when uh, Mr. Comey later wrote a letter saying that based on the discovery of Clinton emails on the Wiener laptop, that they were reopening the investigation that he had already announced closed. And then finally, just days before the general election, November the 6th, 2016, said, we didn't find anything in the, on the laptop that would change my conclusions based on the press conference of July the 6th. Did you likewise find that to be an extraordinary, I will use the word bizarre, uh, it, but certainly unprecedented event? Yeah, the whole sequence uh, was very herky-jerky and bizarre, but at that time, I, I was a little of a contrarian uh, in that I basically took the position that uh, once he did what he did in July and said the thing was over, uh, and then found out it wasn't over. Uh, he, you know, he had no choice but to correct the record. Um, so I, I said that he had no choice but to do what he did. But it sort of shows you what happens when you start disregarding the normal procedures and established practice, is that you sort of dig yourself a deeper and deeper hole. Why is it that the Department of Justice rules, which also apply to the FBI, um, make it clear that our chief law enforcement agencies in this country should not get tangled up in election politics? Are there policies in place that uh, try to insulate uh, the investigations and the decisions of the Department of Justice and FBI from getting involved in elections? Yes, Senator, there are. And, and why, why is that? Well, obviously because the incumbent party has their hands on the le—among other reasons, they have their hands on the levers of the law enforcement uh, apparatus of the country, and you don't want it used against the opposing political party. And that's what happened when the uh, counterintelligence investigation of um, the Trump campaign began in late July and continued on through, uh, well, presumably to uh, Director Comey's uh, tr firing 
and uh, and beyond. Well, I, I, I'm not in a position to you know, make a judgment about it because I don't know what the predicate was for it. I, I, I think I said, you know, it's, it's strange to have a counterintelligence uh, investigation of a president, but I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I just don't know what the predicate is. And, and if I'm confirmed, I assume I'll find out. Rod Rosenstein's memo recommending the termination of James Comey as FBI director it was dated May the 9th, 2017. It's, it's entitled Restoring Public Confidence in the FBI. I take it you've read the memo, and uh, do you agree with its conclusion? I completely agree with Rod Rosenstein, and I thought the important point he made from my standpoint was not the particular um, usurpation that occurred but it was, as I think he says, that that uh, Director Comey just didn't recognize that that was a mistake, and and so it was going to potentially be a continuing problem. That uh, his appreciation of his role vis-a-vis -vis the Attorney General. As I said, the title of the memo is "Restoring Public Confidence in the FBI." Um, do you agree that? restoration of public confidence in the FBI and Department of Justice as a apolitical or non-political law enforcement um, organization is um, important? It's critical. And needed. And it's critical, and that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here. I'd like to help with that process. Well, Mr. Barr, I think you're uniquely qualified to do that, and um, I wish you uh, Godspeed. Thank you, Senator. It couldn't be more important. Thank you. Thank you. Senator. Mr. Barb, uh, we've never had a chance to meet, but I welcome you to this committee. Thank you. You seem like a rational person. I'd like to ask you a question. When you consider what Jeff Sessions went through as the Attorney General for President Donald Trump, where he was subjected to unrelenting criticism, primarily because, as a matter of conscience, he decided he had a conflict of interest and should remove himself from any decisions by the special counsel concerning the Russia investigation. When you consider that this president has lashed out on a personal basis against federal judges who ruled against his administration, when you consider the criticism which he has leveled at the chief law enforcement investigative agency of the Department of Justice, the FBI, as well as our intelligence agencies, when you see the exit lanes glutted of those leaving the White House at every single level, why do you want this job? Well, because I love the department. I love, and, and all its components, including the FBI. I think they're critical institutions uh, that are essential to preserving the rule of law, which is the, the, the heartbeat of this country. And I'd like to think that, that there was bipartisan consensus when I was last in this position that I acted with, with independence and professionalism and integrity, and I had very strong and productive relationships across the aisle, which, which were important, I think, to trying to get some things done. And I feel that I'm in a position in life where I can provide the leadership necessary to protect the independence uh, and the reputation of the department and serve in this administration. A number of my colleagues on both sides have asked, and I'll bet you'll hear more, questions along the line of what would be your breaking point? When would you pick up and leave? When is your Jim Mattis moment when the president has asked you to do something which you think is inconsistent with your oath? Doesn't that give you some pause as you embark on this journey? Uh, it might give me pause if I was 45 or 50 years old, <laughs> but it doesn't give me pause right now because uh, I, I, had, I had a very good life. I have a very good life. I love it. Uh, but I also want to help in this circumstance, and I am not going to do anything that I think is wrong, and I will not be bullied into doing anything I think is wrong by anybody, whether it be editorial boards or Congress or the president. I'm going to do what I think is right. 
you have a very nice family behind you. Thank you. I'm glad you introduced Thank you, sir. And uh, I don't want to give your grandson any career advice. He's received quite a bit uh, this morning already. <laughs> but he ought to consider, at least for some balance, being a public defender. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that you alluded to as a major issue of concern is immigration, and I'm glad you said it. Our government is shut down now over the issues of border security and immigration, and the Attorney General plays a central role, which many people don't know as they look at the Department of Homeland Security for most of the action on the issue of immigration. <clears throat> I was surprised at the exit interview by General Kelly when he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that Attorney General Sessions was responsible for the zero tolerance policy that was uh, uh, announced uh, in mid-2018. And that it was because of that policy, that was one of the reasons why he was uh, being asked to leave. That's the first I'd ever heard. Are you familiar with the zero tolerance policy? Generally, Senator, yes. I can tell you that it was an effort to take escorted children, infants, toddlers, and children, and forcibly remove them from their parents at the border. This policy by our government separated up to 2,800 of those children and put them into the system, the same system as unaccompanied children. The results were horrible. I saw them firsthand. And you have alluded in your opening statement to stopping people from crashing through the border, breaking and flouting the laws. Those young children, for the most part, were being brought to this country by their parents to seek asylum. You can present yourself at America's border and seek asylum legally, can you not? Yes, Senator, you can. So separating those children from their parents uh, in an effort as Attorney General Sessions explained uh, to get tough with uh, families presenting themselves at the border was a policy decision on his part. Do you agree with that policy decision? Well, I'm not sure I know all the details because one of the disadvantages I have is I'm not in the department and, and, and don't really have uh, the same backing I did uh, in terms of information that I had last time, but my understanding is that DHS makes the decision as to who they're going to apprehend and hold. Now, you can claim asylum, but that doesn't mean you can waltz into the country uh, no, freely. You, of course not. Okay, and you have to be processed. And my understanding is a majority of people do not qualify for asylum. But um, DHS makes a decision who to hold and, uh, and, and charge with the crime of illegal entry. And then they refer it to the Department of Justice. And I believe the department's policy, when they say, when the department says zero tolerance, they're saying whatever DHS refers to us in the way of illegal entry prosecutions will prosecute. Now, now what is being done, because I think uh, the administration has changed the policy, is DHS is not referring for prosecution uh, uh, family units that would lead to the separation of children from it the family units. It is true that the president and the administration abandoned the policy after there was a public reaction to the separation of these children. I'm concerned, I want to go back to your uh, University of Virginia Miller Center speech, mm -hmm. uh, which is... It's a gem, isn't it? <laughs> it's a classic, and uh, it goes back many years. But you described your previous tenure as as Attorney General, and you said, after being appointed, I quickly developed some initiatives on the immigration issue that would create more border patrols, change immigration rules, streamline processing. It would furthermore put the Bush campaign ahead of the Democrats on the immigration issue, which I saw as extremely important in 1992. I felt that a strong policy on immigration was necessary for the president to carry California, a key state in the election. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty revealing statement about a political agenda. Yeah, there's, and there's nothing wrong with that, because as, as I've said, you know, the attorney, and, and I've spoken on this a number of times, there's sort of three roles the attorney general plays. Uh, one is uh, the enforcer of the law, and that the role of the attorney general is to keep the enforcement process sacrosanct from political influence. 
The second one is as legal advisor, uh, and that is in the uh, Judiciary Act of 1789, legal advisor to the president and the cabinet. And there I say the attorney general's role is to provide, you know, unvarnished, straight from the shoulder legal advice as to what the attorney general believes is the right answer under the law. And then the third role is the policy role, which is law enforcement policy, which includes immigration policy. And there you are a political uh, subordinate of the president. And it's okay to, uh, to propose policies that are politically advantageous. Well, but I have to say that, you know, that was casual conversation. The point was, I was pursuing a, a strong immigration policy even when I was deputy long before, uh, you know, the election was on the horizon. And in traveling around the country, visiting the border, vi paying a lot of visits to California, I saw how important the issue was, and I thought the administration had to be more responsive to it. And yes, there was a political benefit to it. I just have a short time left. Uh, the chairman, our new chairman, congratulations, Graham, noted uh, 10 years of work uh, by a number of us on this committee on a bipartisan basis to deal with criminal sentencing and prison reform. Mm -hmm. And the First Step Act, signed by the president uh, around Christmas, I think is a significant departure. I learned, uh, as many have, that the approach, the get tough approach that we imposed with a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack and powder mm -hmm. didn't work. Mm -hmm. Did not work. The number of drugs being sold on the street increased. The price of the drugs went down. The people being incarcerated went up dramatically. And we learned the hard way. That was not the way to deal with the issue. And now we're trying to clean up 10 years later, or more, 25 years later, from the 100 to 1 disparity. I voted the wrong way on 100 to 1. Now I know, uh, in retrospect. You've made some hardline statements about this issue in criminal sentencing in the past. And many of us believe, on a bipartisan basis, we've got to look at this anew and not repeat these mistakes again. So I would like to hear your assurance that you are, you have learned, as I have, that there is a better way, could be a more effective way, and that as Attorney General, you will help us implement the First Step Act and design the second step. Absolutely, Senator. Um, <clears throat> from my perspective, the very draconian penalties on crack were put into place initially because when the crack epidemic first hit, it was like nuclear weapons going off in the inner city. And, and as I think you'll recall, a lot of the community leaders at that time, that time were saying, you got to, you know, this is killing us. You have to do something. So the initial reaction uh, of draconian penalties was actually, you know, trying to, trying to help those communities. And over time, and now, the same leaders are saying to us, this has been devastating, you know, generation after generation of, uh, of our people are being incarcerated, have been incarcerated and lost their lives because of this, and, and, and you have to change the policies. And, and, and I think that that is, we should listen to the same people we were listening to before. Uh, I, I, I supported generally strong penalties on drugs because, not just crack, because I felt the, the money involved was so high that, uh, you know, you needed something to counteract that. Uh, I also said repeatedly over the years of the drug war that I felt that the head of the snake is outside the country. <laughs> and the place to fight this uh, aggressively is at the source more than on the street corner. And I used to say we could, you know, stack up generation after generation of people in prison and it'll, it'll still keep on coming. And so I always felt that, and, and I support a adjustment to these sentences and the safety valve and so forth. Uh, to me, the corollary is we have to really start thinking and using all our national uh, uh, forms of power in the sense of our diplomacy and our and our you know economic leverage and so forth to get better results overseas so for example now fentanyl is sort of the new crack fentanyl and fentanyl analogs are the, sort of the new crack and they're coming in from china so across the mexican border correct correct at ports of entry 90% mm -hmm. so 
And that's a long-winded answer to your question, which is I understand that things have changed since 1992. I, I you know, I, I held on a little bit longer to uh, keeping strong sentences maybe than others. Part of that was I wasn't involved in the business anymore. I, did, I wasn't at Justice Department looking at reports and studies, learning about different things in the country. I was, you know, arguing with the FCC about telecommunications rules. So, uh, uh, Ms. Barr, yeah. that was a great answer, and it was long-winded. Okay, <laughs> Senator Lee. <laughs> Mr. After Barth. this, we'll Thank break you. to 12.15 for lunch and a comfort break. Mr. Barr, thank you very much for your willingness to spend time with us today and your willingness to be considered for this important position yet again. Well, thank you. Great to have your family here. And I, I can't help but comment, uh, a lot of people have talked about Liam today, uh, probably more than any of his other uh, <laughs> friends or classmates, people of his age cohort. People were thinking about what he might do for a living. <laughs> Unlike some of my colleagues who have suggested medicine, I, I, I want to just sort of uh, suggest what I've suggested to my three children, which is that I'm not going to push them in any career choice, which in our family means that you can be any kind of lawyer you want. <laughs> Just keep that in mind uh, with Liam. Um, I'd like to talk to you first about civil asset forfeiture. Um, it, it, as you know, civil forfeiture and criminal forfeiture are two very different things, two very different species of government taking someone's asset. With criminal forfeiture, of course, the, the government's ability to take something away, away is predicated upon a conviction of a crime. With civil asset forfeiture, that happens even in the absence of a conviction. There are some serious questions, of course, regarding the legality and constitutionality of uh, civil asset forfeiture, uh, and uh, Justice Thomas, for example, has questioned uh, whether some of these practices are constitutional. I was uh, encouraged to note that in your testimony in 1991, you identified this uh, as an issue. Uh, when you testified before this committee, you, you criticized what you described as the speed trap mentality of forfeiture. Your point was that, uh, quote, agencies should not feel that just because they seize money, they're going to get the money, close quote. Now, since 1991, I've, I've seen uh, our, our government, our law enforcement agencies, actually move more toward this sort of speed trap mentality rather than away from it, as uh, many of us would have preferred. And too often, uh, law enforcement agencies have too strong an incentive uh, to use civil asset forfeiture in a way that uh, lines their own coffers outside of the, uh, the, the relevant appropriations process. So uh, let me just uh, ask you the question, do you, do you um, think that the speed trap mentality is a problem? And if so, is that something that you'll work to address within the Department of Justice if you're confirmed? Yes, I think constant vigilance is necessary because, the, you know, there are incentives there that are, should be of concern in, in, in administering the law. And um, I understand that there are some, hor you know, people who are concerned about it have some horror stories. The people at the Justice Department have been trying to clamp down. I think Attorney General Sessions put out some guidelines that were supposed to address that. I haven't gotten into it myself. I plan to get into it um, and see exactly you know, what the horror stories are, where the problems and potential abuses are, and, and also how, w whether uh, Attorney General Sessions' uh, guidelines are providing sufficient protection. At the same time, you know, I think uh, it is a valuable tool in, in law enforcement, and the state and local law enforcement officer, uh, uh, our, our partners, uh, it's very important to them. So I want to make sure we strike the right balance. And once I have a chance to review it, I, I'd be glad to come up and, and talk to you about that. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I understand that it's a... Uh, a tool that uh, that many consider valuable, and um, it, but a tool that can be considered valuable for some of those same reasons. Something that's considered valuable to the government uh, can, in, in many instances, jeopardize uh, an individual um, right that is protected under the Constitution. We've got to be careful of that. When you refer to the partnership that sometimes takes place between state and federal authorities, this is sometimes where we see it abused. Uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, 
procedure known as equitable sharing, where sometimes uh, state law might prohibit the use of civil asset forfeiture under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And in those circumstances, those uh, state law enforcement agencies might work with federal law enforcement for the specific purpose of evading um, uh, state law that would otherwise prohibit that. So I, I, I hope that's something you'll look into as well. Yes. Um, let's talk about antitrust for a minute. Um, along with Senator Klobuchar, I, I chair the antitrust subcommittee. Uh, and as I'm sure you're aware, there are a growing number of people who take the position, who embrace the viewpoint that we should use antitrust law to address a whole host of social and economic harms. Uh, to, among other things, to ensure that companies respect the First Amendment or to prevent large companies from becoming too big or to shape labor markets or to conform uh, industries to a particular aesthetic or achieve some other broadly defined uh, social interest. Um, I'd like to know what your view on, is on this. Is, uh, are you a believer in the sort of uh, big is bad uh, mentality or you do, do you gravitate more toward the idea that our antitrust laws are there to protect consumers and should focus on consumer welfare and prices that consumers face. Yes, I mean, generally that's where I stand, which is the purpose of the antitrust laws, obviously, is to protect competition and that competition, it is competition that ultimately redounds to consumer benefits. Um, at the same time, um, I'm sort of interested in stepping back and reassessing or learning more about uh, how the antitrust division has been uh, uh, functioning and, and what their priorities are. Um, I don't think big is necessarily bad, but I think a lot of people wonder how such huge behemoths uh, that now exist in Silicon Valley have taken shape under the nose of the antitrust enforcers. And, they're, and you know, you can win that place in the, market sh in the marketplace without violating the antitrust laws. But I, I want to find out more about that dynamic. Right. It, it, yeah. And, and in some circumstances, uh, a company that becomes too big ends up behaving in a way and exerting market dominance in a way that impairs consumer welfare uh, anti-competitively. In other circumstances, consolidation uh, can bring about lower prices and increased competition. I assume you wouldn't disagree with either of those statements. No, Senator. Um, as, as you know, and as several of my colleagues have mentioned, President Trump signed into law the First Step Act about a month ago. Um, uh, this is legislation that I applaud and legislation that I've been working on in one way or another uh, for, for eight years and uh, was pleased to team up with, uh, with Senator Grassley, uh, Senator Durbin, um, uh, Senator Booker, and others to work on that over the course of many years. Um, as you know, the, the Attorney General has an important role under the First Step Act in appointing members to something called the Independent Review Commission. That Independent Review Commission will make recommendations concerning which offenders might be eligible for earned credits under this legislation and which uh, programs will be approved. Um, when we drafted this legislation, there were some members who were concerned that uh, the, uh, whoever was the attorney general at the time uh, of this law's passage and implementation might be able to undermine the effectiveness of this law by appointing members who didn't uh, uh, agree with or believe in the objectives of the bill. So uh, will you commit to me, uh, Mr. Barr, that, that uh, you will appoint people to that um, independent review commission who are honest, honest brokers uh, to decide which offenders should be eligible and which programs should be eligible to participate? Yes, Senator. Thank you. Um, you familiar, uh, familiar with the Ashcroft Sessions policy, um, uh, namely the policy um, requiring prosecutors to charge the um, most uh, significant readily provable offense? Yes, Senator. Tell me how that should best be balanced out with the discretion of a prosecutor. Uh, um, 
most frequently, of course, with the discretion of a local U.S. attorney's office. Well, I was going to say, I think the best way of balancing it out is to have a supervisor who is able to approve departures from that policy based on the specific circumstances. And, and there are in countless different, you know, permutations of facts that might justify a departure from it. So uh, I, I think it's best handled by supervisory people. But uh, I also think it has to be looked at centrally. Uh, I'm not saying that each case has to be approved centrally, but there has to be some monitoring of what's going on because as you know, what, one of the things that led to the sentencing guidelines was, uh, you know, just difference, big differences in the way that the laws were being applied and enforced around the country. And I think we need to keep, try to strive for as much uniformity as we can. But you intend to continue that policy? Yes. And, and, and Unless someone tells me a good reason not to. And if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that if you do follow it, uh, you will defer uh, to the judgment of the office in question um, in the case of determining when to not charge the most serious readily provable offense? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I, w I won't defer to uh, my subordinates. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say, yeah, I will defer to my subordinates. I mean, usually you do defer to your subordinates, but there might be a case I disagree with and I'll assert myself on it. Okay. I see my time has expired. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Senator Lee. Uh, we'll take a recess to 12:15 and start with Senator.